Lynn Cullen live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hello and welcome to the program. Uh, I really uh, just got in and um, I'm a little discombobulated. And uh, it is a Thursday, in fact, the 10th of April. One would usually expect to see Mr. Sokolowski here, but he's in New York. And uh, in his stead, I'll bring in my sister in St. Louis, who wasn't able to join us on her usual day on Tuesday. Hi, Suze. Hi. So Hi. we'll all be all confused. Yeah, right. I'm all mixed up. I, and, I, I, and I'm sort of, because I, I get downtown, I'm running a teeny bit late, and, and I turn, try to turn onto the street where I go to make a, and, and there's a barricade and a guy saying, no, no, you can't, and then I'm off wandering. You know, it's, uh, it's not an easy downtown to find a place on the street where you can park, which is what I was having to do. But I did! Well, and you here also I, scared your poor producer. Yeah, I know. But, I mean, I think Jess knows that I, I'll always text you if I really think I'm not going to make it. So, I, 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 I mean, I knew I would make it, even if I walked in a minute before the show starts. Ah, well, it certainly gets one's adrenaline going. So, um, does this feel weird for you on a Thursday, Susan? Yeah. It does? <laughs> yeah, it does. Anytime we're out of our our schedule. No, I will, I will probably think it's Tuesday all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Isn't that odd? Well, so what did I want? I saw some something here. It's uh, uh, as you know, the big story here is you know what the big story here is. Yes, I know what the big yeah, story okay. is. I'm 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 sorry. Yeah. And and I also uh, was not surprised that it took uh, cable news about two seconds to find a guy that said, and if somebody had a gun in there, they could have just shot him. Well, my understanding is that somebody did have a gun in there. Right. Um, my understanding is that the, the security officer did, in fact, have a gun, and I think think he saw that he didn't need to use it and or that it would be dangerous that he'd be whatever. likely to kill well but he was right there with the guy he used less lethal he did the right thing for, he right. absolutely did the right thing so you know it is true the the gun nuts came out of the woodwork within seconds yeah so and all i have to say to them is that so far we have no fatalities that's right and that would not have been the case oh my god oh my god no so we have no fatalities. We have one one boy who really got the worst of it. Who um, had? They are still quite hopeful. Will, will they are. Through. He had in he had a second surgery uh, in the early hours this morning, um, but he's definitely in critical condition and was on life support. Mm. You know, whenever you hear that, that's sort of like a misnomer now because you hear life support and you think dead, don't right. you? Yeah, it's like yeah, but that's, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. No. And um, yes, they're still being uh, hopeful, uh, but pretty much every organ in his uh, trunk took uh, took a hit, nicked his heart, uh, his cut his liver. Cut, it's just unbelievable. They said that it almost went, that knife almost went all the way 
through them. So here's a question from Roger right off the bat. Um, can anyone explain why we are being told less than 24 hours after this tragedy uh, that this kid is being charged and as an, as an adult? Shouldn't we all take a breath and get all the facts before we plan prosecutions? Just sitting in my home and listening to reports tells me something is wrong with this 16-year-old. Are we that vengeful of a society, or is there some legal reason why he's be con being considered an adult already? Am I too sensitive or just plain clueless? Um, I, I have noted often that if a crime... I mean, I don't know why they have this thing, this adult and, 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 and child thing, if they don't if they don't use it, because it seems to me children are often tried as adults as soon as the crime becomes, you know, like attempted homicide or homicide. Um, and all of a sudden, the, uh, the security of being thought to be not quite formed enough to make um, uh, judgments uh, doesn't protect you anymore, and you're immediately thrown into the adult system. I don't understand well, or that either. How a child for one crime is not a child for another. Excuse you're me. You're either a child or you aren't a child, or a child is a child in one state and not in another. I mean, how we can how we can have a system that we adjudicate who is a child on a case by case basis is a little troublesome to me. Well, it is to me. It is to me too, and I'm saying that is what seems yeah, I mean, to happen. It's hardly equal justice under the law. Well, right, but isn't that what happens in your area too? I mean, all of us. Oh, of course. And I'll tell so, you something, depending on how oversized and what color the, you know, 12-year-old boy is, the more likely, the younger they'll be willing to make him an adult. If it's a, what, a 6-foot, 14-year-old uh, uh, black kid, uh, he's going to be tried as an adult. You betcha. Yeah. Um, I don't get it. I don't know. So... An adult, I believe, I don't know if they go by 18 or 21. I think 18 is what they go by. Um, he's not 18. He's 16. He's a sophomore in high school. I don't you know, know. And the other thing is, is what do we know about boys' brains that we, well, we can't do just know. take judicial notice of? Well, we, that, but, you know, we, we, there is scientific evidence that boys' brains mature in a different way and a different rate than girls, and that one of the things that is the slowest to develop in young boys and in, in teenage boys is impulse control. Right. Exactly. I mean, you know, just, I, I mean, the parents are, you know, they don't, they don't even understand what happened. They didn't know this person. Right. You know, and I, I, I as I... Which I totally believe, because I, that's backed up by everybody that knew him. Right. And I have to tell you, at, at that age, uh, many children live sort of dual lives. I feel like I did in many ways. I was a very depressed, troubled teenager. But on the outside, I think people thought I was, you know, I was perfectly functional and popular and all that. Susan, you were there, so you sort of remember right. this. But in my head and heart, I was just, I was going through hell. Right. You were, you were a pretty unhappy mess. I That's was you know. a mess. And it, it didn't explode in violence, but if I'd maybe been... I don't know, just a different... Well, it resulted in destructive behavior. You yeah, just directed it against yourself. At myself, yourself, at myself. But this is an age when even the best of kids are struggling and confused and, and, and filled yeah. with anger and terror and all this stuff. And, and, and this kid did not seem to have the kind of uh, support around him that I even had, because I did have a bunch of friends. I, I get the impression he didn't make friends easily. But he wasn't a loner. He, he, he was on sports teams. Yeah, he was just shy. Really shy and a tortured, shy, miserable kid. And when you, you know, when I saw the first picture of him, he, he doesn't look 16. He, he, he looks like a little kid. He, he, he's very slight, 
and he's he just looks small. It's I don't know. I, I, but here again, uh, we will fill our prisons yet again with uh, another mentally disturbed person uh, who is in need of more help than punishment. Well, uh, you know, in this case, if, if I haven't seen a picture of him, if, if the child is as you describe him, and they've rushed to judgment and certified him to stand trial and as an adult, it's going to lead a jury um, to look for a way out of doing what they have to do, because they'll feel like they're looking at a child. They'll see, and the, the defense attorney is going to use that. They'll see the boy. Well, yeah. the, the defense attorney is already using it because he's uh, been widely quoted as saying, "Look, he's a very depressed, uh, frightened, sixteen-year-old uh, sk- who who looks like a twelve-year-old." That's what he's right. saying. But any di- he just looks slight, and 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 I, yeah. So I don't know what we say. I, we just go round and round in this country about this stuff, but just can't seem to can't seem to get focused on um, on pulling away from punitive uh, reaction and instead. Uh, trying to be more helpful. I mean, I heard, I heard a man call a talk show today who, that is not known for, you know, attracting sensitive, empathetic people. And he said, I have to tell you, I, I feel like, you know, punching this kid and I feel like hugging this kid. And I think, right. I think that's what, you know, God, what did you do? But on the other hand, you want to... You just want to help him in some yeah, way. Yeah, in a way that you wouldn't have if he'd actually gone in and blown away a bunch of kids. He did terrible damage, and and something needs to be you know happen as a result of that. But yeah, we shouldn't be rushing him. We should be trying to figure out. Here we have a case of a kid that we can ask that we can talk to him and say, what made you do this? Well, you know what he did say to, um, as he was restrained, that he wanted to die. And yesterday, when this was still going down, I said, so often when somebody does this, right. this, is, this is a, attempt at suicide. Someone right. to take him out. Right. He's, he's uh, going out in a blaze of, of glory so that people will then ask, oh, what was wrong or, or whatever, that that's what's, you know, sort of, I, I'm, I'm going to die, but I'm going to take these people with me, as many as I can get. And so his plan went totally awry um, in that the officer with the gun didn't pull it didn't use it, and uh, he was tackled, and he only had a few little uh, problems with his hand, which who knows what could have happened. He was not, I mean, this was actually handled, I think, extremely well, and as you say, he is alive to, uh, to help us understand. But, how, a, how a kid gets driven to this, and what we need to be looking for. And you know what, this other time... You know, and it's for what it's worth, because everybody's an individual. It's not going to give you any rules. Mm-hmm. It'll help you with this one instance. But, um, so the, the same talk show that I'm listening to, I'm driving in today, and I'm listening to, and the guy is going to a commercial, and he says, so who's to blame? Who's to blame? You know, that was that that's a setup question for getting his people why, to call. Why in. is that the question? You tell me. You tell me. What do you mean who's to blame? Why do we Where? always have to be pointing? <sighs> well somehow you know, somehow this kid found himself in a place where this is what he did. No one's the kids to blame. Yeah. The kids to blame. Ultimately, the kids to blame. He acted, and this is what happened. Nobody forced him to do this. Nobody's terrible, you know. You know, parenting did this. This right. is this is this this is happening way too often to looking to to looking that way at this answer. 
They're... I mean, you know, I think part of it, I, I think it happens more and more for the very obvious reason that the kids have been taught to do it. In a way. By I've... each other. By, you by know, us. having access to guns to seeing it happen. And media. There's nothing that we can right. stop it. But kids didn't used to blow each other away in mass murders until, you know, we had the media that, that made us all terribly aware of it. So we know what's happened. We've taught them to, to but do I, this. But see, and, and there, I'm not sure what you do about that. There's um, nothing you can do about it. Because this is a story that our, has to be covered. Our world. So, so how do we respond? How do we teach our kids that just because you can and others have, you mustn't? But you, you can't point a great big finger at, at, you know, some problem that we can put some sort of Band-Aid on. That's just, we live in a violent society. Tell me about it. And the violence is going to be there whether, you know, in this respect, you know, whether there are guns or not, clearly there'll be violence. But at least it won't be, if we got a little bit better about gun control, at least it wouldn't be quite as lethal. Well, isn't that interesting? Because uh, in the in the wake of uh, the carnage at uh, in Murraysville uh, yesterday, the Tennessee Senate voted to cancel gun safety classes as requirements for openly carrying um, a gun in that state, and you can also carry without a license. How is that possible? How is that even possible? The Tennessee Senate voted by a wide margin to permit any gun owner to openly carry a firearm. Uh, this law would eliminate the requirement that gun owners complete a training course on firearm safety before they are allowed to wander the streets of Tennessee armed. Well, you know, I'd, I'd sort of uh, like to put Tennessee and Missouri legislators together because yesterday the Missouri legislators voted not to extend um, uh, the right of women, abused women, time off to go to court to get protective orders for what? their workplace. And, you know, so I suggested upon reading this that, uh, that that's great. We should, um, all us gals should just arm ourselves and shoot first and ask questions later. So Tennessee just made that easier for me. That's good. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, <laughs> that's where we are. I'll just shoot you. And, 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 and who's to blame? Who's to blame? <laughs> we, well, what? Who, who's to blame? The NRA? Um, our, well, no, at this point, it's our way beyond the NRA. There's, it's a, there's a ton of doofuses that, that absolutely believe that they have the right to carry their guns wherever they want. Um, you know, this, this knee-jerk reaction that the, the way you deal with this poten these mass killing things is that if everyone had a gun they wouldn't happen and that is as usual so often the right has no facts on their side um and there are no facts uh to but buttress that um so uh there's a law professor in texas who has crunched the numbers and listen to this what percentage of death from gunfire of all the shootings, of all the people who die in this country through gunshot wounds, how many of them die in a situation like a mass shooting? That's four people or more are killed. Um, you know, so the school shootings, the theater shootings, the if this had been a gun yesterday, that kind of a thing. How many, how big an issue is this? And, and if we're all going to be armed because of the number of people who are dying in these mass shootings, you know what the percentage is? What? Is it one percent of all homicides by gun? No. Is it half of one percent of all? No. It is, in fact, one tenth of one percent 
of all deaths from gunfire in this country occur during a mass shooting. So, in reaction to that one-tenth of one percent of deaths, uh, we should all, we should throw out all the gun control uh, legislation that we have managed somehow to pass. And, oh, and, just we should put our, and we should put guns in every school with the armed guards, yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, I will, and, and you know, if, if I'd been thinking, I would have known the answer. I mean, because all I have to do is look at my local paper to see how many people get blown away on an average night. No, most people are killed uh, by people they know. They are killed by friends and family. Or toddlers picking up their parents' guns and blowing away their friends and, and siblings. The, 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 the... Being killed by a gun by a stranger is, again, I, I wish I knew that number, too, because that is way, 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 way down. And it is also provable that people who have guns in their homes are less safe, are more likely to die because of that gun or someone in the house is. But you can't. We get we come to this pretty pass all the time. You cannot get that through the head of somebody who feels safer if they've got a gun. They just because that's what they believe and they feel safer. You, it, facts again. It's it, it, facts have no standing. Ay 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 ay. No facts have no standing. No. I mean, there was. I, I was listening to the radio a couple of days ago, and the, and and there was a um, a report about out of i probably from the BBC about um, media and its accuracy in reporting climate change, and and they were very upset with um, Fox. No, 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 no. This is in in England. They oh, were in upset because they were not giving enough credence and reporting to the other side, whether it was and that as in there is no such thing, regardless of whether that was requiring requiring them to print fact or not. <laughs> and it's this it's this thought that we have to that the other side always deserves to be heard. Right, that there's some kind That's, of true balance that needs to occur, even if... Right, even when the other side is, is deliberately, you know, or not deliberately, but is factually wrong. It's like saying you have to report that, you know, one eyewitness saw the person and described them correctly. And another saw the person and described them incorrectly. There's, there's a right or there's a wrong. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, we got to get a break in here. Um, unless you guys have anything more to say on uh, the horrors from Franklin Regional no, yesterday. Uh, we will move on to another topic, but feel free if you do want to jump in here. As you know, the phone number is 412-316-3, what the hell is that phone number? 3381. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never call it. Why should I know it? There it is, right behind me, 316-3381. What, I got eyes in the back of my head, huh? And you can also email me at Lynn. Y-N-N, at pghcitypaper.com. Okay, quickie, truly, and we'll be right back. More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. BergBargains.com is your best bet for great deals in the Berg. Log on today for exclusive bargains from your favorite events and shows like PyroFest, City Theater, The Improv, plus discounts on gift cards to P.F. Chang's and Winghart's. BergBargains.com, Pittsburgh's best bargains. BergBargains.com. We will not be an easy target. We will never roll over and let pain plan our day. We will protect our bodies and fight back by moving. We will do our morning laps, walk our dogs around the block, pass up the elevator and proudly take the stairs. 
because arthritis can't beat us if we beat it first. In the fight against arthritis, you need a weapon. What's yours? To learn more, visit us at fightarthritispain.org. This message brought to you by the Arthritis Foundation and the Ad Council. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Okay, 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 okay. Um, so I came across this piece from, um, I think, The Guardian, the, uh, a newspaper out of uh, the UK. Suze? Yeah, I know The Guardian. Okay. And um, it, it's about sort of different um, labor laws in, in, uh, in European countries. And, and as we know, uh, the kind of labor laws that exist in European countries are so, <laughs> they're so alien to Americans because we don't get the kind of protections that Europeans do get on the job in many ways, many, many ways. And I was reading this thing, and I was blown away by some of what passes as proper public policy regarding workers. And, you know, it's interesting, maybe I'm so Americanized, having been, that I think some of this stuff is... It's crazy. Yes! Yeah, no, it it goes beyond uh, what... yeah, I mean, yeah. I, or, or like we have such a sort of, Americans do work harder than most. I mean, we have such a strong work ethic, but but good God, listen to this. I, I'm going to focus on France uh, for a moment. You ever wonder why they can, you know, be sitting out at cafes, uh, you know, for hours on end? Uh, uh. Okay, there's a new labor law in France now that makes it illegal for anyone who works in the digital sector. What I don't even know what that means, since I feel like we're all in the digital sector, but in the digital sector, they say including uh, the French offices of Google, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, blah, 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 blah. It is illegal for workers to respond to w- emails from work after 6 p.m. Now, <laughs> I can see making it illegal for it. Uh, it's so odd. It's illegal for the worker to access his or her email after 6 if it involves work. And in fact, the labor law says that uh, staff will be ordered to switch off their phones and professional phones and that companies must ensure that their employees come under no pressure to look at work-related emails or documents after 6 p.m., Apple was recently fined for making staff in France work at night. The law forbids anybody being uh, forced to work from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. So there are no graveyard shifts. Um, So I have to tell you, (laughs) I find that what do you think, Susan? I mean, are well, we I, I are we so screwed it, up here? Um, are we so screwed up? A little up? heavy-handed. On the other hand, uh, you know, I do know that the people in this country have jobs where they never stop. Uh, where they never stop, and right. because they can access stuff at home, they are expected to. Exactly. Or if other people are doing that kind of work, and this person wants to get ahead, then they have to do it too in order to compete to get ahead. Exactly. So I understand how it happens, but I think it's overblown. I think there are other ways to protect workers. You know, you can say, you know, you, you can't work any more than X number of hours in a 24-hour period, and that would allow you to, you know, the same protection, but give you more freedom, actually. But what's odd is telling, to me, what's really odd about this is telling... It's forgetting the worker, is penalizing the worker. Right! 
What if you got a guy who's working? It's hard to claim that that's not a disincentive in a very un-American way to our way of thinking. Well, all I know is if I'm working on something and it's just... Uh, exciting me, and I can't. Say, what I'm? It's against the law for me to work at home on it because I want to finish this up so that when I go in, in the, I mean, I do think that a lot of employers, especially now that we all have cell. I remember when cell phones and all that stuff came in, I was so uh, pissed off, frankly, because I was in television at the time. And you know, if a news event happened and you knew you'd be called in. All you had to do is not answer your, you know, oh, I was out. <laughs> I didn't hear right. you calling. Now you know that no matter what, they can get you out of bed at 3 in the morning. You are never safe. You're getting called in on your vacation day, called in on weekends, and that is, in fact, what happened. So, and people went on vacation and were expected to be connected. So for Americans, we never get away. We're never allowed to get away from work. But having the government come in and tell me as a worker, you are not allowed to access your business email after 6 p.m., I'd say to the government, up yours. Right. Right. I, if I feel like working, I want to work. But, here, you know, I, it's, it's hard to figure out what the proper balance is because here, right. you it's know, too we fi- can't get any kind of protections in that regard. So right. when Obama signs the, you know, issues the executive order about overtime for salaried employees. Yes. Exactly how is that salary employee going to demand it? Exactly get, right. Get that. Yeah, right. How would that be? Because that salaried employee also has absolutely no job protections. At all. And all the, all the boss has to say is, you want that or do you want to be fired? That's right. No, American workers, since we have chosen increasingly not to uh, band together uh, in unions, um, have gotten screwed with more and more and more and more and more. I've during my working life, I have seen it, and it's just mind blowing. Okay, but here's well, a, and I would say that it goes right along with the you know the the loss of of the power of labor unions. Absolutely, which serve to protect all absolutely. of us. Absolutely, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. As soon as unions membership started going down, 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 workers' pay all over, whether you're union or not, started going down, 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 and uh, everything went to hell in a handbasket. Why people can't connect the dots is beyond me. Okay, but let me, let's take another country here. Here we go to Sweden now. Um, in a city in Sweden, the city council there announced this week that it is... What? Trialing? What kind of a word is that? Trialing? Oh, it's 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 good. it's a trial, and no. which has now become a verb. That means to put a practice uh, to do a trial run. Right. Trialing. Have you heard? Oh no! Have you heard that before? No. But well, that's you just heard really it. What it means. Yeah, that is what it means. Maybe this is. Oh, Well, this is from a British newspaper, so they're already saying it. I suppose it'll come here soon enough. Okay, so a city council says it's trialing six-hour workdays with full pay. Uh, The experiment is based on the theory that after six hours of work, employees become tired and productivity is reduced. Now, that may in fact be true. Yeah, but you still get some incremental benefit from hours seven and eight. Well, the de- so why would you pay? Why would you throw away that incremental benefit just for six hours? Well, or for two less hours. Here's the mayor. I think there's a point of of diminishing return and ridiculousness about this. Okay. I really do. Okay, here's the mayor um, of of uh, of Gothenburg. Or Gothenburg. Uh, he says a six hour work day. Uh, has produced positive results at a car factory in the city. And he hopes that the trial will reduce inefficiency and here's the part they're thinking of, which we never do, and create more jobs. So if you pull everybody down to six hours, 
but the factory's still running, that means you're creating more jobs. I like that part. Well, I, I do, too, and then you increase product productivity, but there's only so much that, you know, of your product that you need to produce, and if you are, I thought we started this discussion by saying you were going to be earning the same amount in six hours that you did in eight. Is that, I don't think that's clear from here. I don't think that's clear. I would imagine it is. Well, I, I don't know. No, that's not clear. I mean, if you're telling me you're going to be paid three quarters of what you would have earned in aid, and you can live on that, and they're in, we're going to employ twice as many people, or, or, or a quarter more people, and they're going to get a living wage as well, then that makes sense. But what if what we're doing is employing everybody at just not quite enough? Okay. Well, I think, you know, we're talking here really about work-life balance and what makes sense uh, for the economies of a country and what makes sense for the health and welfare of the workers. And in the United States, we are way out of whack on this. We're terribly out of whack. Totally. But I really, I would argue that there are some things that are easily, more easily accomplished on a smaller scale. So that when we're looking at some of these, you know, more, you know, quote, advanced, unquote, countries, we got to remember that they're the size of one of our states. They have a much more homogeneous population. Right. They, it's much easier to institute control and reward its people because, in this case, small is easier. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, it's not always true. Right. Sometimes the economies of scale make other things easier. But I don't think that's the case here. Yeah. Um, this, uh, there's somebody who wrote something, which I think is really good. Uh, they say the work ethic, <laughs> seeing work as the really what human worth and value are all about is a pathological disease in our civilization and ideology to keep us from living and thinking and creating and revolting. And, you know, there's something to be said for that, too. Well, that, and again, it depends on the kind of work you're doing. Right. If you're, if you're standing on an assembly line doing, you know... Repetitive jobs. Uh, it's one thing. If your job is, is fulfilling and intellectually stimulating, and, you know, as many are, Not, then what you love to do is your job, and you're one of the lucky people. Do you know what I, you know, it, it, I don't think all that many jobs are, but you know what? Whenever I see somebody with not a high-status job, in fact, maybe a low-status job, and they are in it full. They are enjoying it. They are, you, you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the person, the, the bus driver who is nice to absolutely everybody who comes right. on and, and comes off, and and um, the, uh, the clerk who's... Uh, you know, like that. The um, there was a guy at the TSA in Philadelphia that, at the airport that I saw who, one of those awful TSA jobs, and he was putting on a show for everybody who was stuck in line, miserable, and and he was taking that damn job and, and injecting it with creativity and life and personality because that was him and he, that was him and the, he was and what a what an example to everybody there because he made us laugh it made me think and it's a great lesson in how anything you do if you do it with you know everything in your being you get so much more out of it Right. No, if you, if, you, if you approach each task, no matter how menial, with creativity and joy, it turns out that it, that it turns back on you. Right. And, you, I mean, obviously, though, we're saying some jobs don't seem to allow for any creativity. 
but uh, he found a way to make his. I mean, if you're there to stick one screw into, you know, one spot in a, the, I, I don't know how you get creative. Although, you know, I'm reminded of the traffic cop here who was made famous um, year, decades ago. Um, he's supposed to direct traffic. And, and he's the first one, as far as we know, who decided to make it into a ballet. Right. You know, and, 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 and he was having a ball. And he was still directing the traffic, and he was creating joy for everybody who wandered into his <laughs> intersection. Okay, we do have some uh, more emails to digest. I think this might take us back to the uh, first topic. Okay. Actually, maybe what I should do is take my break, okay. and uh, we'll come back and get back um, into your emails. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Download the brand new CP Haps app and find out what's going on in Pittsburgh. It's the fun and free app that puts the most popular events at your fingertips. Text events to 77948 to download now and register to win tickets to Pittsburgh versus Cincinnati on April 23rd at PNC Park. The CP Haps app, brought to you by Pittsburgh City Paper. All right, I've gone through all the tracks, just move through the beats. Do your thing. All right, everyone, let's hear it for West High's own Brooke Turner, a.k.a. DJ Hook. Scratching at my first school dance takes confidence. So getting into college, I've got what it takes. So do you. Visit knowhowtogo.org to learn what you should be doing right now to prepare for college. Start taking the steps at knowhowtogo.org. Brought to you by the American Council on Education, Lumina Foundation, and the Ad Council. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Okie doke, back to um, your... Your voices. Gigi writes, for various circumstances, I was prisoner to WTAE's news coverage um, at Franklin Regional yesterday. In their seeming excitement to cover the story, more than one person repeatedly referred to the event as a mass shooting. Well, it's sort of what we, <laughs> you know, it sure looks like, a sh- you know, the, these things have been shootings up till now. I think it's good that they covered the story for the whole day, but I fail to understand how they could, on more than one occasion, reference mass shootings. Well, I I just think because it's in your head that that's what this is. One of the anchors eventually apologized and corrected herself, but then seemingly gave an excuse saying, we hear about mass shootings so often. This was not a shooting. I think this is what... Okay, I think you're being a little hard here, Gigi. Um, um, you knew it wasn't a shooting. They know it's not a shooting. But when you're talking off the top of your head and... Um, you saw your brain goes into autopilot. Yes, and I mean, from every... If you were to have just been shown the scene there, um, all the ambulances, the life flight helicopters taken off, the distraught children, the blood, the this, the that... At the school, you would, in your head, would think mass shooting. You would, because that's what it has always been. So I, 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 I think you're, you're being hard. Having been in that position, it's a slip. And um, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd cut him a break on that one. I really would. The news I saw, I thought people did pretty well yesterday. I really did. You know, the... Uh, some reporters better than others, but uh, I thought some really um, can be proud of what they did yesterday. Okay, here's Ray. Uh, Ladies, he writes, well, we'll try to live up to that. Ladies, I've had many a heated debate with my fellow liberals over the public school systems as they exist today. I propose that they are institutions doomed to fail because they reflect assumptions that are no longer valid. As the arguments reach a certain point, I ask my fellow liberals, if we had never created the public school system but wanted to create them today from scratch, would we ever think to create what we have now? I talk about an exercise for creativity. I have, and and Ray goes on to say, I have never gotten an, 
no one's ever answered yes. Why do we continue down a path we would never have started down if we had the foresight to avoid? We are trying to fix an unrepairable pseudo-prison school model. I think that's just the biggest so, pile of bull I've ever okay. heard. He's got two more sentences. Let me just do it, okay? If I were to suggest any other endeavor that took children and treated them the way they are treated in the school system, I would be prosecuted for child endangerment. We never seem to be courageous enough to admit defeat and start over. Okay, Suze, pile of shit. All right, uh, say? I'll say it again, that bull. Oh, okay. I mean, that's just the most ridiculous. First of all, education is constantly changing and and evolving and and in in including science of how we learn and changing the way it does. I'm not saying that all schools are perfect or that all children get equal opportunity. If he wants to talk about how we fund and, and, and equal access to equally good schools everywhere, then he has, then we can talk. But that's not what he's talking about. What's he he's talking, talking about? about what happens in every single school building at, you know, and treating them as if they're all the same. And just condemning a something that I don't think he knows a damn thing about. Well, he certainly hasn't ever had anything to do with schools or seen the creativity and 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 the good things that happen in them. I mean, clearly. Okay. Well, I, I'm a little confused, uh, Ray, by your uh, yeah, the, this sort of like blanket. Uh, condemnation of schools as they exist today. The quasi-prison thing, I get that up to an extent. I do get that. But um, an awful lot of American children go to these public schools and are, you know, reasonably educated. I was. Susan was. Um, are they that? And a My lot. Kids were your kids really were really educated. Really educated. That it's happening right now in schools all over. But you're right. There's a great discrepancy. I, I mean, I don't see the problem so much as in the schools as in the way we fund in the our schools. Funding, school. funding is what's destroyed everything. Excellent schools. Yeah. There are some amazingly, there are far more excellent schools than bad ones. And it's this constant. In, you know, constant refusal to admit that there is anything good, that teachers can do anything good, that administrators can do anything good, and casting all these people as evil NEA kind of people. I mean, it's just, it's, it's horrifying to me. They are not prisons. And as a matter of fact, they are saving a whole lot of kids where that prison school that you're saying is, is 150, 200 percent better than their homes. Hmm. You know, so Ray, I, Ray. I am, I have, I've had it way over the top of my head about people constantly taking a whole group of people or a whole industry and, or a whole educational system and just blanketing it, you know, with a pile of crap. Because that's, that, that's what that email is. It's a pile of crap. So you're saying <laughs> he paints with too broad a brush because you know there are schools, we have them around here, that I don't think much education is going on in. And no, we those have them happen, here too. but they happen in poor neighborhoods because right. we don't, because of the funding thing, We're which trying, is, if, which if is if obscene. If he wants to talk different ways of funding, I'm right with him. If he uh. wants to talk equal access to equally good schools, I'm right there with him. But where he's absolutely wrong is saying that our, the way our educational system is, in total, is bad. It isn't. As a matter of fact, it's more good than it's bad. Oh, okay. And if I had it to well. design, I don't, the reason no one answers them is, cause, is because it's a stupid question. I, of course you take children and, and put them someplace so that they could learn, which we call a school. And schools in this country look all different. Classrooms are, some are open. Some have kids in multiple grades that get educated together. That, you know, there's all sorts of things that happen in the American public school educational system, of which he clearly knows nothing. Ho, ho, ho. All right, Ray, you got ten minutes to come back at us. Meanwhile, we'll move on to Ansel, who's back in France, um, and and that their their working at their work ethic there, if they can be said to have one. 
Uh, here in America, we live to work, and we are rewarded for that, and sometimes not. As a programmer, it has been literally years since I have had a work week that is less than 50 hours, and 60 hours is not uncommon. Outside of America, the mantra is work to live. And France's new law simply embraces what Europe has been promoting in general for decades. You need only look at the paid vacation time in Europe, yeah, which averages six to eight weeks. Oh, my God. No, and they give incredible, you know, if you have a baby, you're off for the year, your job's there for the... I mean, they are more humane in that way. And you could argue, well, then how does their economy even function? Um, yeah, in some but cases, they do, it, you know, it, it doesn't it very well. In others, it does. Yeah, like the Spanish are being rousted out of their, you know, three-hour afternoon nap. Um <laughs> It, it, because they're suffering now. You can't, in this day and age, continue with that model of, well, we You work. have to be producing right. enough to do it. And, and that's why I said the smaller scale in this case might work better, but the bigger and more populous, you, you know, more population you get, the harder it is. Yeah. Well... And I, I, you know, and and to some extent, I mean, you know, talk about disincentives. You know, it's a, it's a, just a totally foreign concept to to the way this country is developed. Totally foreign. And it and it doesn't mean that that you know the extreme of either of our places is right. Because I do think people are are being required to work far too way hard, too, too hard, way and, too hard and, for and, not and, enough. And, and it's a really cynical, you know, use of. Corporate, the corporate I agree. Power. Totally agree. There's something very sinister going on here. Uh, changing the subject yet again, Rich writes, this has probably received little attention, but the defense attorney for the uh, boy, attacker, Patrick Thomasy, well, Rich, um, is a real, and I'll just, he doesn't, it's a bad thing he's calling him. I mean, he's saying he's a jerk. I was involved in a case as a witness a few years back. I watched this guy get away with directing outright lies and even placing witnesses on the stand that weren't even at the scene, and he gets away with it. This kid might walk, at least with very little repercussion. Has anyone investigated the possible involvement of heroin? Heroin? Franklin Regional has a huge problem with this. Yeah, what? what? Suze, what are you blah, 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 blah? Well, I just don't think that that's how heroin presents. <laughs> I agree. I think Her- you know, <laughs> if you're if you're if you're shooting up on heroin, you're, you're nodding not- out in a corner someplace. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, hey, Rich, defense attorneys. Patrick, That's what defense attorneys, attorneys do. do. It's their job. It's their job. Patrick Thomasy, the de- the defense attorney in question, is a very successful. Uh, when I saw that the family had uh, had hired him, I thought, well, the kid's going to get the best kind. Criminal court is theater. And, and, I mean, pure and simple, it is theater. And it's who tells the most convincing story. Um, if there's truth in there, all to the better. But it's theater. It is. I mean, it is. That's the truth. And you might have seen it up front and in a way that just enraged you, but uh, he's no more what you called him than almost than any no. defense attorney. And, and 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 here's the trick: the trick is you have to have faith not in the system, but in the jury. And see, I don't all too often. We are placing every. <laughs> that's why it's so important to take jury duty seriously, because really. The, the attorneys, the prosecutor's job is to put that person in jail. You know, hopefully the police have done their job and there's the right guy. But it, when it's his job to put that guy in jail, he doesn't really care. He's going to put him in jail. And the defense attorney, it's his job not ever to even find out whether his a client is guilty or innocent. It's his job to get him off. Okay. Caller, and go there ahead. Are rules, but we Call. depend on Hello? the jury. Yeah, hi. They are the Susan. I, I didn't want to talk. I just wanted Lynn to pose the question. Yeah. During Governor Corbett's speech yesterday, 
he never mentioned his sympathy or empathy and concern towards the victims and their families. The first words out of his mouth were how proud he was of the responders, but he never recognized those families and those victims, and his um, sympathy and thoughts, good thoughts towards them were everyone else who spoke at that newscast. That was the first thing that they said, and I found that very odd and uncaring. Okay. Those, the human elements of it, he sort of took the whole event out. It was how they responded after the fact and not to the people who experienced it and also the victims who witnessed it and weren't even harmed who uh-huh. were going to have yeah. post-traumatic stress syndrome from this. He never mentioned those families and those victims and his sympathy towards them. Okay. All thank right, you. let's oh, thank you. I'll have to tell you, uh, you know, so they had this news conference, uh, and the governor, uh, uh, you know, came running in from Harrisburg, which I found his presence there in general annoying. Um, and I didn't notice that, what you're saying myself, but um, he was there to. <laughs> Get a lot of free air time because it, yeah, it, it aired. It was a photo op. It aired on CNN and MSNBC, and he was all over national news. And um, I don't know. I don't know what he what he wanted to say was. Yeah, he wanted to pat a lot of people on the back, fine, and the heroes. And I was most sort of put off by when he said, and you know, the people who did, who jumped in and were heroes, and I want you to write that down, he says to the media sitting there. And I thought, hey, buddy, you know, back, just back it back a little bit. They know what to say and what not to say. I don't know. And I also, when he was introduced, he was introduced by the guy who said, you know, the governor's busy and he's got to go back, so we'll have him on. You know, everybody else was a local schmo. And the governor comes in and gets to do his thing and tell reporters what to write, and off he goes. I just generally did not like his his whole uh, presence there. Uh, but, you know, th- this is a time when Pauls will jump on the opportunity, as Susan said. I mean, there, there it was. It presented itself. I thought he said some good things. Um, you know, I think uh, acknowledging the role of, uh, you know, the – the teachers, the support staff, other students for saving lives and this and that. It, he may, it might have just, you know, in the moment he was talking without notes. So I'm sure, I'm sure he would have, if he'd thought about it, meant to say what you felt was lacking. I just, I didn't see any reason for him to be there personally. But, you know, I'm not naive. Um, we also have another question from Barbara about uh, media coverage. Uh, TAE and KDK just carried a live press conference with a victim, a parent, and surgeons. Uh, how much coverage is appropriate? Do you, th- you and Susan think that all day coverage yesterday was appropriate? Yeah. If it's a local story, yesterday all day coverage I think was warranted um, because it was, you know, the breaking news is a term that's overused uh, and misused. But this was a, a breaking news story all day. We were all wondering about um, how how these people who'd been transferred to hospitals were faring. Uh, we also wanted to uh, know more about uh, the the perp and uh, his story. And I think, you know, they actually pulled it off in general, not like I watched for 10 hours straight. But I, I think in general there was – that was a – I think a legitimate use of television news because people are, it's the big story um, and it's a story that people wanted to have information about and people are going in and out of their lives. So I guess the, 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 they wanted to be on the air, just constantly uh, being there. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If they were doing it again today, I would think there's something wrong with that. And I'm not so sure about breaking into a press conference with a victim, a parent, and surgeons. I mean, if every victim um, decides to have a news conference, uh, where we are given a blow-by-blow description of their... I don't know that that's the kind of thing you need to break into television programming for. 
Um, but he, it's in these uh, immediate breaking news events, like yesterday, where television news, which I, you know, criticize constantly, can in fact do a great job and a public service. And and I will say, with whatever maybe mistakes were made yesterday, I think in general what I saw was pretty good. I wouldn't be doing this breaking in with this today. I wouldn't. You know, media just wants more and more and more and more. And, and they'll be after all these kids for a long time. And I don't know. I, I personally have had my fill at the moment. I want the kid at Presby to get out of danger. I want all of the ones that are still in critical condition. I think we got, what, two or three. I want them out. And I want to start being able to relax and know that everybody, in fact, is going to be okay. Um, that's all I want. But, yeah, the big day was yesterday. I don't think we need to get nuts here. Susan? Yeah. You, would you agree with that? I mean, yeah. if that was a St. Louis story, would you have thought they should stay on the air all day to let us know? Um, I, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and probably would have been watching all day, unlike, you know, they're, they're 24 hours, 7, it's raining outside. Yeah, I think exactly. This, and, and again, a situation like this, where it's a it's a really local, awful, big story. Of I would think that that kind of coverage for that day is warranted. Okay, uh, Rich is coming back with. Okay, I'll give you the point on the attorney, but with heroin, the person doesn't necessarily need to be on it at the moment. The effect afterward can lead to this type of behavior. There are many cases of drastic behavior change due to heroin. I I'd be surprised. I'm not surprised if you're telling me that there's kids who are doing heroin at Franklin Regional, because I think increasingly... There's kids everywhere doing heroin. Yeah. Okay, here is Ray, Susan, coming back at you, and I know we're out of time, so he's going to end up getting... Well, he'll. I'll read it, and I'll give my sister the last word, okay? Ladies, I have worked in nearly every school in the Pittsburgh public schools. I am on the school board of a private school in the city. I don't think my disagreement with your esteemed sister bespeaks my ignorance of the topic, but rather my difference of opinion. So easy on the personal attacks, he says, Susan. I am not talking about the people who are delivering the product, but the way in which it is delivered and the environment it is delivered in. I find it hard to believe that we should create a collection of buildings transportation systems and sorting systems that in Pittsburgh has a larger annual budget than the city itself. The question is not a load of crap, but blaming it on funding if the funding funds the same old wineskin is. Well, well, but he just changed his whole point. Why? He's because just, he, he talked, he's, he ended up talking about the funding. He says blaming it on the funding... Uh, okay, so no, but he says to then fund the same schools, it doesn't matter how you fund them, if you fund the same way that we're, for some reason, I don't know. I, it, I, do, I still don't understand what you, he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, Ray, we don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you know, d d give me some specifics. You're sitting on the board, you're sitting on the board of a private school that seems to be in a building with probably classes pre-K through 12, that's going to look exactly like any other school, so I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, we don't know what, Ray, we don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you haven't given us one specific, so we don't know what you're talking about. So we'll give us more, and this will... And I will say that his, his original letter did cast a, a, you know, with a very broad brush, a real stink bomb overall public education, which I think is totally unwarranted and unfair. Okay. All right, you two. <laughs> Ray, I, I think you're not giving me enough specifics. I'm, I'm still confused about your damnation. Um, what is the why? Uh, what are you basing it on? That's all. And what do you suggest? Yeah. You, and what do you are suggest? so impressed with everybody else's not having an answer. Where's yours? I mean, if you've been in nearly every school in the Pittsburgh public schools, have you been in the one that educated my son? Have you been in? Have you been over at Alderdice or at Kappa? I mean, they're they, they keep spitting out incredibly 
well-educated kids who are, you know, going into the the best schools. I, I, I don't quite understand. Now, there is an apartheid system in the Pittsburgh public schools, which I hate. And so they, they there's some kids who can go in and not and sort of be left by the wayside. Um, but throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I don't quite understand. No, okay. I don't either. All right, okay. Oh, we never got to the strippers at the old folks' home. Damn it. Aww. Aww, sh- <laughs> All right, Suze. Hey, it was nice having you on a Thursday. Okay, talk to you Tuesday. Uh, no, you won't. Okay, never. Oh, I won't. I will I. Happy Passover. Yeah, happy Passover to you, too. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.